Hey everyone, how you doing? All right, uh, disclaimer, I woke up way too early today, so this one uh, might be a little interesting. And it's probably going to run long. I'm going through the Book of Judges right now, and there's some very horrible examples there of how to live a, a holy life. So definitely some very bad mistakes made there. But I figured I would go through one of the more popular ones. Um, Samson, I'm pretty sure everyone's heard of Samson, so... I think you can see that on the screen here. So we'll go ahead and go through this one. Like I said, it's going to run long, so sorry about that. Watch it on the weekend or you know whenever you have time if you want to watch it. So here we go. This this one's going to take a while. Uh, and the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. So that's a reoccurring theme. The Israelites fall away from God. They kind of go their own way, worship, you know, Canaanite gods, things like that. Um, they, they don't live with the Lord, right? They, they go their own way. Definitely miss the mark. So in this scenario, uh, for the story here, they're handed into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years, right? They, they went so far astray that they were handed to the Philistines for 40 years to be oppressed. Very long time. Um, there was a certain man of Zorah, of the tribe of Danites. And sorry about the pronunciations. I'm sure I'm butchering some of these. So I apologize. Uh, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. So angel of the Lord shows up, um, tells her basically you're barren, which I'm sure they know at this point, and, but don't worry, you're going to conceive a child, a son. So, Therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. Right. So the angel shows up and wisely tells them, don't drink anything, no alcohol at all, no intoxicants, nothing, no coffee, no caffeine. Right. The way is very it's, it's stringent. It's a holy lifestyle. So, yeah, no wine, no strong drink, nothing unclean. That means vegan, just to be clear. Right. No animal products at all. You have to be completely holy. You're not oppressing animals, people, nothing. Completely holy. So you eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. So basically dedicated to God from the womb, set apart. Uh, the hair thing, it's not its not exactly accurate. Um, but I understand, you know, during their time, that's, that's what it was, so... No razor shall come upon his head. So he can't shave his head at all, right? He's been dedicated to God from birth. And unlike a Nazarite where you like choose it, it's voluntary. This, you know, the angel told him he's basically a Nazarite from birth. So that's just the way it is. You got to grow up that way. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So already before, you know, she's even conceived, angel tells her she's going to have a kid. It's going to be a boy. He's going to save you from the Philistines, which have oppressed them for 40 years. Very long time. Uh, then the woman came and told her husband, A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. So somehow she knew that this was an angel from God. It doesn't really clarify how, but somehow she knew. I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. Right, because they're not supposed to get the glory God is. Um, but he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink, no intoxicants at all, straight edge lifestyle. Uh, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. So I'm pretty sure Nazarites, it was a voluntary thing. You know, you agreed to do it, to be set apart for God's work. Uh, but this is different, right? He was basically going to be a Nazarite from birth. And not only for a voluntary short period, or for a period of time, this is until death. So Samson was born knowing that he was picked by God. He was set apart from God. Um, so he was going to have to be holy his entire life until the day he died. So that, that's how he was set up. Uh, then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent to me come to us and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah and the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. Uh, but Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly to told, uh, ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. So the angel came back. They asked for the angel. The angel came back. 
And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life and what is his mission? Right, so they don't understand. I mean, I'm pretty sure they were already told he's going to save him for the Philistines, but they're, they don't understand like what his position is, right? And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink or eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. Right? It's all clarified. No intoxicants at all, including caffeine. Very clean, straight-edge lifestyle, very holy. And eat nothing unclean, which would be any animal, right? Plants, fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, seeds, things like that. Those are all good. Those are on the menu. Animal products are not. So that's anything unclean. And then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you probably to sacrifice or eat, I'm guessing. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, If you detain me, I will not eat of your food. So the angel doesn't want the goat. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. No, that's absolutely incorrect. The Lord doesn't need you to burn any of the Lord's creatures up. That's not going to make you look good in front of the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was an angel of the Lord. So the wife knew somehow he doesn't he doesn't get it. He can't see it. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? So that when your words come true, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. Sorry. Um, yeah. So seeing it is wonderful. So basically angels, they, they can't be like famous and take credit. Like they can't take away the glory of God. Right. They're created by God to do God's work, but they can't take the glory from God. The glory is God's. So, so Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders, and Manoah and his wife were watching. God doesn't need your grain. God doesn't need your goats burn up on altars or any of that. You're not even supposed to have idols, so altars, you, you don't need those. Uh, yeah. So God doesn't need any, any burning animals to, to make God happy. That, that's not going to work. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. So apparently they were cooking up these animals and the grain offerings. In the smoke, the angel just disappeared and, and went up into the smoke into heaven. Or into the spiritual realm disappeared. The angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. I would guess that's pretty common when people see angels, because angels are way more powerful than humans, but not nearly as powerful as God. It was just power bestowed upon them by God to do God's work. So I would guess to like certain people they would seem like God. Um... So, you know, uh, let's see. And, uh, yeah, to where is my skills? He would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering in our hands if the Lord meant to kill us. He doesn't need any burnt offerings, no grain offerings. I've been clear on that. God doesn't need money. God doesn't need grain. And God doesn't need burnt dead animals that God created. God likes those animals, so please don't set them on fire. Or show us all these things, or now announce to us such things as these. And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson, so he's finally born. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Menadan between Zorah and Eshtol. Sorry about the pronunciation, I'm probably butchering some of these. All right, here we go. This is where it gets interesting with Samson. Samson and women doesn't uh, doesn't really mix. Let's see how it goes. All right, let's see. Uh, so Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. So this is the group oppressing Israel for, for what, 40 years, right? So now he's going to 
date Mary, one of the Philistine girls, it looks like. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. Okay, so it doesn't say that he talked to her. It doesn't say that he knew her, that they had common interest, that they were like soulmates or anything like that. It just says that he went down there and he saw her. And then he said, get me her as his wife. So already we got a problem here with the female relationships here. The, the, the dynamic is off. I mean, he's talking about her like she's property. Number one, she's part of the group that's been oppressing your people for 40 years. So that's going to be awkward for your family and everyone else that knows you. Since you're supposed to be, I guess, uh, saving Israel from the Philistines, that's it's awkward. And the whole reason he did it is because she was pretty. Vanity, pure vanity. Doesn't say that he knew her, that he talked to her. Hold on. And he came up and told us, uh, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her as my wife. So he just saw her. That's it. He just saw her. He saw something he liked about her, whatever that might have been. And he wanted her, right? His loins were encouraged. He was, he was ready to go. Uh, based off of nothing. Didn't know who she was. Didn't know if she was smart. You know, whatever. Just, just basically, he saw something in her that he liked. Pure vanity. Based on looks. A relationship based on looks is going to fail. Pretty much every time. Uh, so let's see. Uh, but his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives? <clears throat> no. No. Incest is not, it's not a thing. So you can't do that. So that's a strange suggestion, but I, I realized during these times, things were a bit different. They kept things a little tighter in the family tree, uh, but that's that's a no-no. So we're going to X that one out. Or among all of your people. So I guess another Israelite. That probably would have made more sense given his position in the story, right? He's supposed to be liberating them from the Philistines, not marrying into them. Um, you know, maybe she's a great girl. I don't know. I don't think he knows because he hasn't even talked to her. He doesn't know anything about her. All he knows is he saw something in her that he really liked because he's vain and his little head's thinking for his big head. So, among all of our people that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines. Yeah. So that was the thing back then. They thought that you had to be circumcised to be in good, good graces with God. I don't think God cares how you manicure your, your manly parts. Um, yeah. I'm circumcised. It's just kind of a thing here in the U.S. Apparently the Israelites were circumcised to show their you know, commitment to God. And the Philistines are not. But I don't think how you manicure your, your parts down there is going to either, you know, get you into the promised land or not. So, but Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. So again, he clarifies, like, the only reason he likes this girl is because she's smoking hot, apparently. He's very taken by her. He sees something in her that he really likes. Doesn't know anything about her. She's part of the tribe that's been oppressing his people for 40 years, so that's going to be super awkward. Um, but, you know, like I said, his little head's thinking for his big head. But here we go. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. Right. Right. So, per the literature here, right? Angel came and said, you're going to bear a son, you're barren, you're going to bear a son. He's going to basically rise up and defeat the Philistines for you. And now because of his sexual urges, right, overcoming his intelligence, he decides he wants to go marry this girl. Uh, at the time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. So he's kind of off course a little bit there on his mission, slightly. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah. And they came to the vineyards of Timnah, and behold, a young lion came toward him, roaring. Now, if the Spirit of the Lord is upon him, you know, this, this would make sense. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. Okay. I know what the Spirit of the Lord feels like, and it doesn't make me want to go take a line and tear it to pieces the way it feels in the spirit of the lord i'll assume they're just talking about the holy spirit right which is basically god's spirit inside you 
when the Spirit of the Lord rushes upon him, like when you feel the Holy Spirit come in you, it feels like pure love. The most pure love. And I'm not talking about sexual, you know, carnal love, uh, sex, anything like that. I'm talking about pure love. Like if love was like an energy inside of your body, just like pulsing out, just pure love, right? When it hits me, like sometimes I'll be driving, like listening to music and like worship music and I'll be listening to it. And you know some of the verses hit me and it just, it comes on me, right? It's just like the spirit, you just start glowing. You start glowing and it feels like pure love. That's the best way I can describe it. If you could get energy into to love somehow and just have that like radiating out of your body, just like pulsing out. And the way it feels, it's like so relaxing. It's like almost like an aphrodisiac. Like my eyes start closing when I'm driving. Like my literally my eyelids start coming down and I can barely see how to slits in my eyes. And I'm just like, it's almost like paralyzing. That's how it feels. That kind of love. So I know what they're talking about here when they say the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. That's kind of what it feels like. It's like a rush. It's like just this glow of love is the best way I can describe it. And you're basically incapacitated. Like you still know what's going on, but it's it's almost like you're on these massive painkillers. But they're, they're it's not dulling pain. It's just literally love just like glowing out of your body. That's what it feels like. So you're like driving and you're just... Your eyes are closing and it it's like an ecstasy of sort. It's kind of like that, but it's not sexual. It's just love. It's nothing to do with sex. Zero. Nothing sexual about it. It's not arousing. It's just like if God reached in and just grabbed your soul, like just took his hand and went in and grabbed your soul and you just started glowing. That's kind of what it feels like. And all you can do is just feel it. And it's like, emanating out of your body it's like pulsing out just it's crazy but just to explain that's what it is right so that's what it feels like and like almost like your eyes roll up in the back of your head almost which is it's quite dangerous when you're driving but you know you try to keep them open a little bit you're just you're glowing it's just this massive glow it's like you're burning with the holy spirit essentially the holy spirit is just burning inside you i'm just explaining what it feels like because it goes with the scripture here and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion into pieces as one tears a young goat. So trust me, when you feel that, when you feel the Holy Spirit burning inside your body in a very, very good way, pure love, you don't have the inclination to go get a lion and tear to pieces, right? God likes animals. God created those animals. God created us. God created angels. So God doesn't go around just destroying his creatures or saying, hey, I want this... This creation to kill this creation. That's that's not how it works. So, yeah, this doesn't make any sense. You know, if that was the spirit of the Lord, you wouldn't want to go murder anything. You would just be sitting there in pure ecstasy, pure love. Like I said, just like God reached into your chest or your head, like in your body, and just like grabbed you. And you just started glowing, like on fire with the Holy Spirit. That's what it feels like. So this doesn't make any sense at all, actually. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes. So this is the girl, I guess, in Timna. He goes down there. He's really in love with her. And on the way there, something came over him, and he decided to murder a lion that was roaring at him. Uh, almost like he would when you were um, kill a young goat, which doesn't make any sense either. You shouldn't kill any animals. Those are God's creations. <clears throat> All right. Uh, <clears throat> After some days, um, he returned to take her. It doesn't sound very voluntary. It's basically like, hey, you're my wife. You know, come with me. So the whole male-female dynamic is just totally wrong here. And he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. So this is strange. He goes back. This is a couple days later. So this carcass is sitting out in the sun, just cooking and baking. There's probably flies and... Or he smells disgusting, just rotting maggots and everything else. Imagine what that looks like after days of just sitting out in the sun. Um, and there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. So in the cavity of this murdered animal that's probably covered in maggots and flies and everything else, it just stinks and reeks. There's apparently bees in there and they've made like a little honey honeycomb or whatever. And there's honey in there. So he scrapes it out into his hands. 
and went on eating as he went. So he scrapes this honey, this comb, out of this rotting corpse. He's probably covered in maggots and stinks. Ugh, the smell. And he's just, just eating this honey just all over his face. Ugh. And, uh, and he came to his father and mother and gave some to them. Ugh. And they ate it. Gross. What are you doing? This thing, it, not, not only is it coming out of this rotting corpse of an animal, it's, like I said, it's probably covered in maggots and flies and it stinks. Oh, holy mackerel. So it just, it's nasty. And then he brings it all the way home, probably in his hand, this, this disgusting blob. And then he gives it to his parents and they're eating it. Oh, oh. <laughs> so weird. Um, but he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of a lion. That is nasty. So he must hate his parents. Number one, like, I don't, <laughs> it's disgusting. The whole story is disgusting. And then you give it to your parents. You don't even tell them like, hey, by the way, I got this out of a rotting corpse that had been on the ground and I've been munching on it all the way home. So I've been eating on it. So you're getting like second dibs, technically third if you count the animal. Um, ugh, it's just nasty. All right. So let's see. And he doesn't even tell him, like, what is that all about? He must hate his parents. His father went down to the woman. So he's, he's lying. He's dating a girl, wants to marry a girl. It's literally part of the group that's oppressing his people. He's on a godly mission to, I guess, overthrow these people. So he's definitely off course a little bit with the mission. And there we go. His father went down to the woman and Samson prepared a feast there. For so the young men used to do. So customary to go down and prepare a feast, I guess. As soon as the people saw him, they brought their companions to be with him. And Samson... Hey! Hey! One second. Sorry, the cats are out there fighting with something. All right, I don't like cutting my videos. That way you know it's from me. So I'm going to leave that in there, even though it's going to look terrible. Sorry about that. All right, so where were we? Um, here's the Philistines. Yeah, Samson went down there. Um, oh, boy, now that got me off. His father went down to the woman and prepared a feast. Here we go. All right. As soon as the people saw him, they brought their 30 companions to be with him. And Samson said to them, let me now put a riddle on you. If you can tell me what it is within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. And they said to him, put your riddle that we may hear it. And he said to them. So he's got these guests from the party from this girl. This Philistine girl. I'm assuming the guests are Philistines too. Um, so basically he's going to do a little riddle with them. And they have to figure it out within seven days. If they don't figure it out in the seven days of the feast, then they have to pay him. So it's 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. It's clothing. So here we go. Here's the riddle. Out of the eater came something to eat. And out of the strong came something sweet. So it's pretty strange. And in three days, they could not solve this riddle. So three days of the seven, they're sitting there, they're beating their heads over, they can't figure it out. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you in your father's house with fire. So I don't know where they found these 30 people, but they seem pretty rough, right? So on the fourth day, they're frustrated. They don't want to have to come up with these linen garments and the uh, change of clothes. They, they don't know where they can find it. So they tell Samson's wife, who's one of their folks, entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is. So basically, before they're even married, you know, she's going to be working for the Philistines. She's going to entice her husband to, um, you know, to get the information here to solve the riddle. 
Have you invited us here to impoverish us? And Samson's wife wept over him and said, You only hate me. You do not love me. His wife, I guess they're already married here. Um, you only hate me. You do not love me. <clears throat> you have put a riddle to my people, and you have not told me what it is. And he said to her, Behold, I have not told my father nor my mother, and shall I tell you? She wept before him the seven days that their feast lasted. And on the seventh day he told her, because she pressed him hard, then she told the riddle to her people. Right, so she was sitting there complaining. You know, he wouldn't tell. They were getting upset the fourth day, so she's there complaining and whining, you know, working for, you know, these folks, I guess the Philistines, she's working for them, uh, trying to get the riddle solved. So she gets the information, it looks like, and then she told the riddle to her people. So now they're going to be able to solve this riddle. And the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? So it's not kind of fair, the riddle he used, like the one, you know, what is it? Out of the strong came something sweet? It's not really fair, because it's a personal story of his that nobody else would have known, because it doesn't make any sense, right? Why would you murder a lion? Number one, how did you murder the lion? That's pretty impressive, because they would destroy a human being, unless you're like a little baby or cub. So somehow, and you use that in the story, like nobody would ever get that. And it's also disgusting that the story just doesn't make any sense. And he said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. So kind of an analogy there between, you know, cows and wives, which is ridiculous. You can see how things were during these times. Women's place in society. So it's not his wife, it's his heifer, apparently. Um, or metaphor, is it a metaphor? Hmm. But basically, yeah, you can see the problems there with female relationships. And now he's upset because his wife or his heifer, as he calls her, um, gave the information to these guests of the party. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. And he went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spoil and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. All right. So here we go again. This is whole, uh, let me go down there and kill a bunch of people and take their stuff. War booty. So he gets upset. The spirit of the Lord rushed over him. I already explained what the spirit of the Lord feels like, the Holy Spirit. It's nothing that's going to make you want to go kill people. Trust me. All you're going to want to do is just sit there and just feel the love of God burning in your body, glowing. You're just glowing with love is the best way I can describe it emanating from your body just like glowing out it's almost like you're on fire that's what it feels like but a very very good fire a fire of love so that's not what it feels like when the spirit of the lord rushes upon you you don't want to go down and murder 30 people to steal their clothing to pay off a riddle which wasn't fair to begin with right it was unfair because it was based on an experience that only he knew nobody else would know that story because it doesn't make any sense in hot anger, he went back to his father's house, right? Spirit of the Lord, anger, no way. Love only, not, not anger. And Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man. So while he was down there murdering all these people to take all their clothing off, and I don't understand, like, wouldn't that clothing have, like, blood all over it? Like, if you're going to pay this debt back and you're going to give them, like, the 30 garments, the 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes, shouldn't they be clean and, like, pressed I don't want them to come like I don't want to get this riddle solved and it's um you okay I don't want to get this riddle solved and then I get these garments and they're covered in blood and like sword holes or axe holes or however he did it like that's not supposed to be you're expected to get these linens like in good shape I want them folded up I want them pressed I want them looking nice you know good colors the tags still on them everything looked nice right I don't want them looking like they just came from a murder scene, you know, covered in blood and stinking with bugs all over them and they're torn up and who knows if he collected everything. You might have like one sock and one sock's missing or, you know, one arm's longer than the other because you tore it off of them. It doesn't make any sense. You it's just, it's weird. Uh, and then, so because of that, because he went down there and did all that while he was busy murdering these, these 30 people to pay off this debt. I guess his wife was given to his companion, his best man. Wow. So be careful who you marry and marry for the right reasons. Don't marry for vanity, right? This, this marriage is based on vanity. He didn't even know this lady. He was just like, 
I like something about her. Something looks nice. So I want her to be my wife. And this is what happened to him. So now his wife was given to his best man. That's unfortunate. So let's see. It gets worse. All right. Samson defeats the Philistines. Here we go. After some days at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson went to visit his wife with a young goat. Again, there's no sacrifices. You're, you're not... God doesn't need your goats. God doesn't need your money. God doesn't need your grain. God has everything that God needs. Doesn't need anything from us. Except for maybe some compliance and some, some mutual love would be nice. And a relationship. I think that's what God wants, is a relationship with you. So if you want to God, give God anything, just give God a relationship. And, you know, take some loving direction. That's it. Just have a relationship. Just chat. Just talk. Doesn't need money. Doesn't need goats. Definitely doesn't need you to murder any animals. Uh, doesn't need grain. God doesn't need anything. Just a relationship with you. That's all God wants. So, if you can do that, if you can just have a relationship with God, that's it. Love God and love all others. Right? Love God and help God's creations here. Right? While we're here. Do good things. For God's creations, which includes the planets, the people, our souls, the animals, everything. Trees, flowers, planets, everything. All of it. The oceans, especially the oceans, everything. And her father said, I really thought that you utterly hated her, so I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please take her instead. So apparently, this guy, who's his father, right? So apparently the father knows Samson, kind of figures Samson out, and realizes what's important to Samson, vanity. Um, so he says, hey, look, I know I gave her away to your best man while you were out murdering people to pay off your your um, riddle, which was unfair to begin with. Um, so hey, why don't you take her younger sister? She's younger. She's prettier. Maybe she's got better curves. Maybe she... You know, pokes up her chest more or pokes out her butt more. Who knows? You know, that's, that's what people do these days. They're all about their vanity. Um, so take her. She's younger. Uh, and, and she's beautiful, right? That's all that matters. It's looks. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter about people's souls or their minds or what they like to do, their relationship with God, which is critical. You don't want to marry someone that doesn't have a relationship with God. So they say don't yoke yourself to unbelievers. It's fine to try to save people, but... In a holy union, if you're going to be in a holy union forever for the rest of your life with someone who's not a believer or believes an incorrect religion, yeah, that's very problematic. You're going to have all kinds of issues. Um, so please take her instead. Basically, just use your eyes. She's pretty. Don't worry about what she thinks. Just that all that matters is her body. So that's apparently this father-in-law knows Samson pretty well. And Samson said to them, This time I shall be innocent in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. That's not true. You won't be innocent. So, Because think about it. Those Philistines were also created by God. Even though they're warring, right, between each other, which humans usually do, uh, we're all created beings. So they're just God's creations fighting God's other creations for reasons. Uh, this time I shall be innocent. Nope, you won't. So Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took torches. And he turned them tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of tails. Okay. All right. So let me get this straight. Samson went and caught 300 foxes, somehow, alive. I don't know how long that would take. I don't even know what the procedure was back then for catching foxes, but somehow he got 300 foxes. And he took torches. And he turned them tail to tail. So I guess pairs of two here. And he like took the torch and he got it lit. And he took the tails and tightened them up there. Um, so he's got a the burning torch between two foxes. Which are probably trying to run in opposite directions I would guess. And when he had set fire to the torches. So there were 150 torches I guess. He let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and set fire to the stacked grain and standing grain as well as all the olive orchards. So he's upset, I guess, because, you know, his best man married his his wife, um, his very pretty wife. 
So he's upset, right? So he decides he wants to burn down all the grain and then harm the Philistines. So he gathers up 300 foxes in pairs, I guess 150 torches, lights them up, ties all their tails up, and even though they're probably running in opposite directions, somehow they run around and they set all these, these grains on fire. Set up this huge like, agricultural fire. So this, this is a bad guy. Then the Philistines said, Who has done this? And they said, Samson, the son-in-law of the Temanite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. So that's the father-in-law. And the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. Well, these are nice folks, aren't they? So they're upset. The Philistines came up because of the arson, right? So they're mad at um, Samson because of the arson. So because of the arson, they go and they burn her and her father. So they set them on fire. These people are just wonderful. This is oof, a rough time period, isn't it? You think God wants to see us acting like this? This is nonsense. And Samson said to them, If this is what you do, I swear I will be avenged on you, and after that I will quit. And he struck them hip and thigh with a great blow. And he went down and stayed in the cleft of the rock of Edom. So I guess he smacked him in the hip before he left. It doesn't really clarify how many are dealing, but I don't know. So I guess you know, he's a violent guy, right? So I guess he just hit some more people, hit him in the thigh. Uh, then the Philistines came up and encamped in Judah and made a raid on Lehi. So now they're raiding. And the men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? They said, We have come to bind Samson, to do to him as he did to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of Rock of Edom and said to Samson, Do you know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us? And he said to them, As they did to me, so I have done to them. So this is almost like that stupid eye for an eye thing, right? Where it's basically just tit for tat, you know, and you see a lot of countries getting into this stuff nowadays, right? I mean, you're allowed to defend yourself, but it's like you get into this situation where it's like you attack me, I attack you. It's like a tit for tat and it just goes back and forth forever. It's it's unfortunate. Um, but, you know, you have evil aligned people that just want to attack innocent folks. So, you know, at the end of the day, you have to, you're allowed to defend yourself, right? Because in a fallen world, you have bad people. Lots of them. And unfortunately, a lot of them, because they're willing to be very, very violent, they get into power. They get into power structures. They get into ruling governments and people. And It's unfortunate, but they have no moral compass. And because of that, you know, they do whatever it takes. They kill, they maim, they set on fire, they beat people, they intimidate, they use violence. That's how they stay in power. And, you know, until recently, that's that's been a thing, you know, and that's worked. Um, but now God's taken a very um, active interest in cleaning up this mess. So, you know, those days are coming to an end. And uh, they said to him, We have come down to bind you, that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. And Samson said to them, Swear to me that you will not attack me yourselves. They said to him, No, we will only bind you and give you into their hands. We will surely not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. All right, so the men of Judah went down there, 3,000. They got him, said, look, we've got to hand you over to the Philistines. They roped him up, and they're taking him up. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and the ropes that were on his arm became as flax as caught fire, and his band, was it, bonds melted off his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, and he put it on his hand, and he took it, and with it he struck a 1,000 men. And Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have struck down a thousand men. So, 3,000 people of Judah went down to the Rock of Edom. They got him, said, hey, you got to go. The Philistines want to see you here. So they roped him up. They took him up there, and then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him again. And I've already explained what the Spirit of the Lord feels like, right? The Holy Spirit. So... It doesn't make you want to murder people. It's just pure love. So he claims the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. And the ropes on his arms became his flax that has caught fire. And his bonds melted off his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey. So the Spirit of the Lord came on him. He grabbed this jawbone of the donkey. He put it in his hand. He took it. And with it, he struck a thousand men. So you got to picture this, right? Spirit of the Lord came on him. He gets this jawbone of a donkey. 
and he just starts wailing on people. He kills a thousand people, smashing them with this jawbone, which apparently was extremely strong. I mean, I know bones are strong and it's a jawbone, so I guess it's really like dense. But to sit there, I don't know how long that would take. And for a thousand people, they must have like lined up single file and come and attack them. Because with a thousand people, it's really difficult to defend yourself, you know. You're getting hit from every angle, right? They're circling around you or they're trying to beat you down. But somehow he had that jawbone and he was just smashing people. He's backhanding them, he's hitting them, you know, hitting them from behind all over. So he's just smashing people with this jawbone. So he gets done. I don't know how long it took. It must have taken a while, but somehow he kills like a thousand people with a jawbone. It's just impressive. And as soon as he had finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone out of his hand. And that place was called Ramath Lee, or Lehi. I tell you what, if that was my story, and I'd, I wouldn't, but if I'd killed like a thousand people with a jawbone of a donkey, I would probably keep it. Right? You want to put that on the mantle in your house or something, right? You know, to to this great story, right? You just killed a thousand Philistines, your enemy, right? God wanted you to, to overthrow the Philistines and you just took out a thousand of them with a jawbone. Not with like a, a sword or an arrow or, you know, whatever weapons they had back then that they used. They didn't have anything like that, right? So you would think that you would keep this jawbone. It's pretty important, like historical, biblical you know, I don't know, a piece of history. But maybe he did, I don't know. And as soon as he's been speaking, he threw away the jawbone out of his hand, right? What? You would keep that. Are you kidding me? Look at how many people go around murdering deer. They get so excited. They're like, oh, I conquered nature. I went out there with this, you know, this uh, 270 rifle with this gigantic, like, 10x scope and I hit this deer from like 400 yards away I'm so amazing I'm so great right you murder these animals and you stuff their heads and you stick them on your wall so you can look at them while you're eating dinner right that's what you do you want to sit around with your family in this dead animal's head just sitting there on the wall staring at you with those little marble eyes because it's weird and sick but you do it I, I don't know why you do it but you do it it's, it's creepy very creepy um but yeah so this guy decides he doesn't it's not a trophy it's not worth keeping he throws it away and he was very thirsty yeah i hear that and he was very thirsty and he called upon the lord and said you have granted this great salvation by the hand of your servant and shall i now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised so he's upset because he's tired he just took this jawbone and mashed and killed a thousand people. Can you imagine how many calories you would burn and how overheated your body would get when you're killing a thousand people with a jawbone? Like, you would be exhausted. I mean, go swing a baseball bat a thousand times, right? Just swing it as hard as you can because that's how hard you would have been swinging. As hard as you can, a thousand times. That's without hitting people, right? And if you're going to kill them with a jawbone, you're going to probably have to hit them multiple times. This is not going to be like a single jawbone to the head and they're dead. That's not how it works with human anatomy. You're going to have to like, boom, boom. You're going to have to like smash on them over and over. Um, hit them in the throat, maybe some like vital organs. I don't know. Hit them in the temple. But you're going to have to put some work in. And for a thousand people, you're going to be there a while. Even if they lined up single file and you had to kill each one, Right. It's going to take a long time to get through a thousand people. And it doesn't say like he stopped to have snacks or like, you know, any energy bars or anything like that. No water. This guy just went ham. I mean, he was just smashing them, thousand of them. So he's thirsty and he's upset. And he's at, he's mad, right? So he's talking to God. He's like, God, I just killed all these people with this jawbone for you. Because I had your spirit on me that wanted me to go murder all these people. And now he's mad because he doesn't have any water. And he doesn't want to be handed over to these people that are uncircumcised. Why God would care about that, I, I have no idea. Um, and then God split open the hollow place that is at Lehi, and water came out of it. So God was like, concede and say, hey, you just put in all that work with that jawbone. You, you did your duty. Here's some water. And then the water appeared. And when he drank, his spirit returned. Now, 
I would say that when he drank, he probably felt better. Because like I said, he's got to be dehydrated. Even swinging a bat a thousand times is going to make you really, really thirsty if you swing as hard as you can, which you would have to do in this scenario. But he's saying when he drank, his spirit returned. And that's not true. Your spirit, the way it is with me, like sometimes, the spirit is returned through like doing good works, like doing God's work, either sharing information or helping people out that are in need, using like sweat. Um, money donations, that's that's needed. You know, it is needed. Um, but it's not, and it's nice. I'm not saying it's not bad. It, it's nice to do that, to help out a good cause for your money. It's a good thing, right? You can help with your, your sweat. You can help with your information. You could help with your money if that's how you're blessed. But I think, at least with me, like the way my spirit gets recharged, it's through like good works, you know, either sharing information or helping people out in need, you know, with physical sweat and toil and then helping them physically. That's how mine gets recharged. It's not through water. Now, I've been very dehydrated. I took an ill-advised bike ride here recently. It was like 34 miles, it turned out being. I didn't plan it to be that long. But I literally almost passed out. I did, actually. I fell over I didn't fall over about it. I kind of put the bike down and laid in the grass for like 20 minutes or so. Because I just couldn't move. I just had no energy. And when I got home, I drank water and my body was refreshed. But it didn't do anything for my spirit. It was just, I was really dehydrated. So I can imagine Samson, after, you know, murking all these people with a jawbone, he was really, really uh, dehydrated. So it's not the spirit that returned, it's just it was his hydration levels. Um, therefore, the name of it was called in Hakori. Uh, it is at Lehi to this day. Like I said, sorry about the pronunciation, I'm sure I'm butchering these. And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines for 20 years. Wow. So this guy who's is pretty morally bankrupt, very vain, very selfish, Got off mission a lot. It's chasing women uh, for the wrong reasons, for looks. Not for who they are, but just for looks. And he's chasing a woman that's not an Israelite, right? It's not, not part of his tribe at the time. It's literally part of the tribe that he's supposed to be, you know, fighting because they're oppressing um, the Israelites for like 40 years. So it's an odd choice. But apparently he was in charge for 20 years. I can only imagine those are 20 wonderful years with the way he operates. So a lot of these judges, go, go read the book of Judges, like some really bad examples of humans in there. Just just how we act, you know, how selfish we are. And thankfully we're not quite this violent, not all of us, but yes, the judges weren't exactly, you know, pillars of society. They, they weren't the most holy people I've ever seen as far as the scripture depicts them. So here we go. Samson and Delilah. I think everyone's heard of this story at least a little bit. So let's get into it. Hold on. Thirsty. Just hydration, not spirit. All right. <clears throat> Samson went to Gaza, and there he saw a prostitute, and he went into her. All right, so here we go. Like I said, Samson is pretty terrible as far as the, the holy meter. Really low. It's pretty awful, actually. He's a pretty horrible person. It's, I don't know, he's a murderer. He's sleeping with prostitutes. He's selfish. He's giving honey from some dead animal to his family. Like, he's... All around, this is just a bad person. Just not good. He's down here, founds a prostitute, and he went into her. So he just finds some lady he doesn't know and just sleeps with her for cash. Nice, huh? And this is what... This guy's a Nazarite, right? He's supposed to be holy from the day he's born until the day he's died. He didn't voluntarily go into it. He was just told, like, you're a Nazarite. That's it. Don't shave your head. No alcohol, nothing like that. You gotta be holy. Don't eat anything unclean. Which you gotta be vegan. So he screwed up everything, and now he's with a prostitute. And the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, and they surrounded the place and set an ambush for him all night at the gate of the city. They kept quiet all night, saying, let us wait till the light of the morning, then we kill him. All right? so the Gazites, they want to they kill him here. He's down there with a, you know, with a prostitute. Nazarite, he's supposed to be holy, he's supposed to be separated for God, right? It's not working out so well. But then Samson lay till midnight, and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts, and he pulled them up, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that is in front of Hebron. So he was laying down with this prostitute until midnight and decides he wants to get up and go out at midnight 
which there's not a lot good going on at midnight. He took hold of the doors of the gate of the city. So the gate of the city is probably massive, right? It's a gate to an entire city. And the two posts. He's got both of them. So he just pulls them up, throws them up on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill at the front of Hebron. I'm not sure why. It doesn't really clarify that. I mean, maybe he either, I don't know. It doesn't really say. But he just grabs the gate, rips it out of the ground, puts it on his shoulders. After this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sork, whose name was Delilah. Good old Delilah. Everyone's heard of her. This is after he bedded down the, the prostitute. Um, and the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Seduce him and see where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him. And that's not humbling like God humbles people. That's different. God humbles you for good reasons. Break you down to the core for good reasons. To get all the goodness out of you, right? And just get all the trash, all the, all the nasty layers, rip those off, and just get the good stuff left inside. But this isn't the kind of humbling they're talking about. And we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Wow. So the Philistines want her to seduce him, and she's agreeing to do it for 1,100 pieces of silver. We each give you 1,100 pieces. That's a lot of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound that one could subdue you. So she agrees to it. So she's not a great person. Delilah's pretty awful, it seems like. Um... She agrees to seduce Samson, right? Samson said to her, If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Then the Lord of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now she had men lying in the ambush in an inner chamber, and she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the bowstrings as a thread of flax snaps when it touches the fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. So she set him up for cash. She doesn't care about him. She's in it for the money. You know, you, you probably heard about some women like that, right? And men. It goes both ways. But she agreed to set the man up for cash, essentially. So this is not a loving man, you know. They're not even married. Yeah. So this is out of wedlock. This is after he was done with the hooker that he didn't marry. So he wasn't married to the hooker, the prostitute, sleeping with her. Then he starts sleeping with this lady. He's not married to her either, right? And this is a Nazarite. He's dedicated to God. He's set apart for holy works for the rest of his life till the day he dies. <coughs> so, so she sets him up. She's got men lying in ambush in the inner chamber, right? And then she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So she's basically telling him, like, hey, I set you up. They're here to, you know, they're here. They're going to be on you. But he snapped the bowstring because he lied to her. Apparently he didn't trust her, right? So he's in a, I don't even call it a relationship. He just met this lady. He probably liked her for one reason or another. He liked the way she looked. He doesn't care about her as a person. They have nothing in common. They really are kind of enemies, you know, at least as the story goes, right? Because the Philistines have been oppressing the Israelites for 40 years, so... He's supposed to be here overthrowing the Philistines. <clears throat> so, not, not doing a great job here with the Philistines. Um, but he snapped the bowstring because he lied to her, because he doesn't even trust her. Then Delilah said to Samson, Behold, you have mocked me and told me lies. Please tell me how you might be bound. Come on, Samson. She's, she's setting you up. You know she's setting you up at this point. Uh, she's lying to you. But now she wants you to go ahead and tell her how you might be bound. After you already know, she set you up to kill you. And he said to her, If they bind me with new ropes that have not been used, then I shall become weak and be like every other man, or any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And the men lying in ambush were in an inner chamber. But he snapped the ropes off his arms like a thread. So this time she gets actively involved, right? She is literally like taking the new ropes and she binds him, right? And then she says to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So she binds him and then does that. But, you know, he, he lied to her because he doesn't trust her. And he already knows at this point she's conniving, right? 
She's literally selling the guy out for cash. Then Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me how you might be bound. So twice now she's crossed him, right? And he knows it. And still she asked him, Tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head with the web and fasten it tight with the pin, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So while he slept, Delilah took the seven locks of his head and wove them into the web. And she made them tight with the pin and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled away the pin, the loom, and the web. So again, you know, she's setting him up, trying to get him killed <clears throat> for cash. <clears throat> for cash. Um, but he lied to her again because he doesn't trust her. And she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and you have not told me where your great strength lies. And when she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. So basically, she was like, look, you've lied to me three times. I don't understand why you don't trust me, even though I'm trying to sell you out for cash and get you killed, you know, to the Philistines. So even though, you know, she starts like harassing him, like, why don't you tell me? Why don't you tell me? And he told her all his heart. And he told her all his heart. And said to her, A razor has never come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. I'm not doing a great job. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Which, that doesn't make sense. Your strength, the strength that God gives you, the spirit that God gives you, has nothing to do with your hair or your body. It has to do with your soul and the works that you do. Because works are expected in whichever way you can do them. You're supposed to be helping God's creations, doing God's work. That, that's that's your job. So he he thinks it's his hair. So that's that's how it is in the story, right? Because he was a Nazarite, he was committed. He was separated to God from birth, from birth till death. His entire life was going to be dedicated to God. <clears throat> it's supposed to be. Uh, if my head is shaved, then my strength will lead me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. So when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, so she knew he was telling the truth, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up again, for he has told me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands. Here's your cash, Delilah. You sold him out. Not your husband, because you're just sleeping with him outside of marriage, but here's the guy you're sleeping with um, because of your looks, because he likes the way you look, because he's vain. He's all about vanity. Um... She made him sleep on her knees, and she called a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him. This lady's nasty. So she sets him up for cash, then she's tormenting him, shaves his head to take his power away, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as the other times and shake myself free. So he thought he got her this time. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. I'm quite certain the Lord would have left this man a long time ago. Right? So, yeah. Um, I don't think God would have waited until this particular moment to leave Samson. After all that Samson had done. I mean, God's very forgiving and, and will work with us through our screw-ups as we miss the mark over and over and over. But this guy's pretty rough. And it definitely didn't have anything to do with his hair. So if the God left him, if God left him, it wasn't because of his hairdo. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in prison. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved, as anybody's hair would. <clears throat> These people are horrible. So the Philistines, they gouged out the man's eyes. So he was with this girl he shouldn't have been with outside of marriage. He knew she was out to get him. He's still with her. So he finally tells her the truth. She gets him weakened. Um, the Philistines come and they get him, snatch him up. They gouge his eyes out. How horrible of a person are you that you can gouge someone's eyes out? You are disgusting. You are like a sinful beast if you can operate like that. You. Oof. God's going to humble you. Um, yeah, so they, ground, they got his eyes, 
spooned him out. I don't know how they did it. They took his eyes out. They blinded him. And then he ground at the mill in the prison. So you've got a blind man pushing around a mill, right? Like they have the animals do. Just pushing it around blind. Can you imagine that life? You're grinding. You're at a mill. You're grinding things for your enemies that gouged your eyes out. And you have to sit there and push this thing around like grinding whatever it is they're grinding wheat or whatever. <clears throat> imagine that life. Right? Now you know what the animals feel like. You got them shackled up, just walking around, grinding, all that stuff. You know? Yeah, it's very similar. Um, but the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Well, yeah. I mean, once you shave your head, your hair does start to grow again. That's that's pretty normal. Here we go. The death of Samson. All right. <clears throat> uh, now the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, or Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hands. No, Samson gave himself into your hands. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, their God, Dagon, the fake God, like many of their gods that people worship these days. For they said, Our God has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country who has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they said, Call Samson that he may entertain us. Oof. So they called Samson out of prison. So Samson's in there grinding stuff up, all these blind. And they want to be entertained. They want him to like, I don't know what that means. Like wander around while he's blind, like trying to find things just to entertain him. These people are disgusting. Like you're a sick, perverted person, full of sin and evil. If you want to see a blind man entertain you, a blind man that you gouge out their eyes and you got him in there just walking around, grinding all the time, blind, like you are horrible. Um, <clears throat> to entertain them, right? They made him stand between the pillars. And Samson said to the young man who held him by the hand, because he couldn't see, he was blind, let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. So all the uppity uppers, right? The upper echelon, know, the politicians, whatever. You know, all the, all the rich folks that are oppressing the people below them. And on the roof, there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson entertained, right? So, for the story here, he's down there, he's between the two pillars. There's like 3,000 people that are up there, men and women, who looked on while Samson was entertaining them while he was blind. These disgusting people. Then Samson called the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O oh God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. So he's, he's still upset because he, he spooned his eyes out. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars of which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them. And his right hand on one, his left hand on the other. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he killed during his life. <clears throat> wow. So he wondered why God left him. He killed 3,000 people, and that was more than the people he'd killed during his life. So, I don't know, 5,000, 4,000, however many it was. This guy's murdered a lot of God's creations, a lot of them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I can understand he was upset, for sure. And these people were heinous. But, per the story, he's killed like 5,000 people in his life. And he was quite immoral, right? Just the way he chose women was based on vanity. It wasn't based on anything else. It wasn't based on love. or He didn't know anything about them. All he knew was that they were pretty. That's what he based everything on. They were pretty. And the prostitutes too, all right? Then his brothers and all his family came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtal in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had judged Israel 20 years. Well, like some of the other judges, you know, the... Uh, the way he judged was not great. He was not a good representative of God at all. Pretty rough life. I mean, he had a horrible ending that he brought on himself, but it's a pretty rough character. And if you have time, go read the book of Judges. There's really bad examples of how to act in there. I don't want to go through all of them. You know, you have Gideon and Abimelech and, and all that. There's a lot of them in there. So there's, go read it. You'll, you'll see. It's interesting. 
definitely not like good nighttime stories for children. Um, but, you know, it's the Old Testament. It's it's awful. But, yeah, that's it. That's Samson. So, you know, Samson, he didn't, didn't listen to his parents. He didn't really honor his mother and his father because he made his own decisions on his marriage based on looks. You know, he just went down there and saw someone was like, she's pretty. I want her. So that started his whole downfall. He was supposed to be dedicated to God his entire life from birth. He's going to be a Nazarite from birth. He didn't voluntarily do it. The angel came down and said, hey, you're a Nazarite from birth. You're going to help us overthrow these Philistines, which have oppressed them for 40 years. That was his job. Um, but unfortunately, instead, he wanted to go find the pretty girl. So he went and found the pretty girl and he married her, you know, against the wishes of his family. And that didn't work out. She ended up with his best man. Oh, that, that was the second one, maybe. Um, yeah, whatever. But yeah. So she ends up with the best man and the Philistines and the whole story. Like, it's just his downfall. Basically, women is kind of, I mean, he got off mission. He got off God's mission for himself because he went chasing pretty girls. That's what happened. He went down the rabbit hole of vanity. And look how it ended up. He ended up with his eyes gouged out and his last final act while he was blind and milling grain or whatever in the prison was that he got to take 3,000 Philistines with him. But... His whole life was destroyed. Oddly enough, he was the last judge. Yeah, I, I mean, with examples like this, I can see why. So, that's it. I figured I would get this video out. Um, get this one going. Sorry, I'm a little bit tired. Uh, but I figured I would get this one out. It's been a couple days. So I hope you enjoyed it. You know, don't be Samson. Don't be the Philistines. Don't be any of these people. Actually, follow God's directions. And, um... Have a relationship with God and listen because <clears throat> we're, um, we're going to go through some rough times. We are going through rough times, but we're going to continue to go through those rough times. So God wants to walk with us during these rough times to help us and to bring us closer to God. So that's it. Just remember God loves us and, like I said, wants to help us with guidance. So please listen and um, don't be Samson. Have a great day.